Joining us this evening for a panel on privatization and education, human rights lessons from Chicago teachers campaigns. I'm Virginia Parks and I'm a faculty member here at the U of C, but I think more importantly, I'm the child of uh, a household where one of the primary wage earners was a union public school teacher. I'm also the product of public schools all the way through, including my PhD. It's a bit of a shock to take a job here. Um, but this is one of the reasons to be at the U of C and because of the human rights program. Tonight, we're going to hear our three esteemed panelists speak on these issues of privatization of public services broadly, but to anchor that conversation in the incredibly thrilling campaigns of the Chicago Teachers Union over the past several years. Of course, with the apex this last fall with the strike. Um, the CTU has led public ca campaigns to promote educational and labor rights in Chicago, which have been widely supported by parents, uh, students, and other labor and community organizations, and I think just community members uh, broadly in Chicago. So these, these campaigns have not only addressed school closings, which we most recently um, experienced, I think, quite painfully, uh, but many other inequities, uh, resource in inequalities, charter school expansion, um, and teachers' workplace conditions and rights on the job. And this has been a critical response to the corporate privatized model of education that's expanding across the U.S. It's really been expanding over the several, past several decades, but we're seeing it come to a head. Um, and as a broader trend of, as I said before, the privatization of public services. So tonight we're going to hear discussions about not only the CTU, but to also place this issue of privatization of education within a broader national and international perspective. Um, before I introduce our panelists, um, a few notes. We want to welcome CanTV in the back. Uh, thank you for recording the event. And uh, do we know when it's going to air? Three to four weeks. Okay, in three to four weeks. So we'll just, and we'll probably uh, send out an email about that. Um, we'd, I'd like to take a quick census of the audience. Um, how many of you are faculty and staff like myself? A, a very few. Um, <laughs> students? Yay. Great. Yay. Uh, other community members? Super. And how many CPS families do we have in the room? We got a couple. All right. <laughs> oh, more than a couple. Great. Um, and lastly, I would hope that we could all give, or I want us all to give a big round of applause to Sarah Moberg. She's in the back of the room. This was uh, her idea. She pulled it together. She's been uh, at, really at the helm right next to Susan Zesch of the Human Rights Program for, program for the last six years. We're sadly going to lose her to UIC next year. She's starting a doctoral program, but it's been fabulous having you here. So tonight, um, we have with us Jesse Sharkey, and I'm gonna have you speak first. Okay. Um, David Moberg, immediately to my right, and Susan Zash. So let me give you their brief bios. Je Jesse is the Vice President of the Chicago Teachers Union, and he served as the union delegate. Prior to becoming the Vice President of the CTU in June of 2010, <laughs> he taught social studies for 10 years in CPS at Sen. In 2004, he worked extensively on the campaign to oppose the establishment of a military academy at Sen. He studied history and education at Brown University, the BA in 1992, at MA in 1997, where he studied and worked with many of the leaders of the Coalition for Essential Schools. Uh, David Moberg is a product of the UFC. He has his doctorate uh, in anthropology on a study of class, conflict, and culture among American auto workers. He's a senior editor at In These Times, where he's worked since the magazine started, and he has written about the labor movement, economic policy, politics, and other issues in a variety of magazines, newspapers, and anthologies. Susan Zesch is senior lecturer in the college at the UFC and executive director of the Human Rights Program here. Prior to taking on her present position in 2001, she had spent the previous two decades in Chicago working as an attorney and policy advocate on civil rights, human rights, election law, and the rights of immigrants and, and refugees. She's a native of the South Side, a graduate of CPS, and the daughter of the member of the, of the CTU. 
She actually, I loved this piece when I got this in the email. She attended the U of C on a scholarship given by the CTU to a child of a union member. <laughs> so it's great. It's pretty good. <laughs> Starting in 2006, she worked with other Chicago lawyers and activists to bring the Chicago police torture cases before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the UN. Jesse, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, the email asking me to speak said, uh, talk about education as a human rights issue, uh, issues around Chicago public schools and school privatization, talk about the strike, um, catch us up on the, on, on the school closings uh, and the other campaigns the union's involved in. And I said, great. So I'll be talking for about three hours. And <laughs> no, um, I, I, I won't. I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes. Um, and I'll, I'll necessarily be a little schematic. Uh, I, I, wanna, I, I do want to sort of begin by um, looking at the question of um, education as a human rights issue. Um, I think by acknowledging uh, that a number of, of sort of things that are said about our schools uh, in, the in the mainstream public debate actually have a, have a degree of truth to them. You, you know, um, education does give access to jobs. So for example, you know, the, the, the census department says the difference between someone with an eighth grade education and someone with a professional degree is $72,000 a year in terms of what you earn. Um, uh, you know, we've got all these structural changes in our economy. It's hard to find fulfilling work, you, you know, if you're a high school dropout. I mean, it is. Um, you know, maybe in the past you could work on a family farm and that was meaningful to you, but uh, now you can, you know, you'll work at the family, con you know, convenience store kind of thing. Um, the economy as a whole, uh, you know, is, is transforming in ways that you'll be, you, hear, you hear Bill Gates talking about how, you know, uh, by 2018, 63% of the new jobs are going to require college education. And it's clear that there's a lot of people who are very wealthy who see the, 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 the fitness of the American economy to compete on a global scale as being attached to education. Um, that's their reasons. But those reasons are, are, are valid for everybody in, in, in some ways. Um, you know, it's not just economics, really. Education also unlocks human potential. You know, the ability to study art. I mean, who knows where, where the next, you know, um, genius of, of expressive art is, you know, is in, in the city of Chicago, um, you know, and needs to really be given some, some skills and some tools in a school in, in order to unlock their, their, um, their potential. It also creates the basis for democratic society. And so for all those reasons, leaving people out of education is unacceptable. It's unacceptable to society, um, and, and really not having access to good schools is a human rights issue uh, along that line. Um, you know, um, Gates said that education is an issue of national security and that no other issue is more important. Um, Fox News put it in a much more Fox News kind of way. It said, um, you know, poor schools put U.S. in peril, <laughs> which is <laughs> that's the way Fox would say it. But, um, I, but I, I do want to point out that, you know, a, a, even, that this is not something which just sort of, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, those crazy public school teachers in the CTU are saying that really this is the very top of our society. Uh, Obama said, um, it's an undeniable fact that countries that out-educate us today will out-compete us tomorrow. Uh, and I want to come back to this notion of competitiveness because I think it's one of the sort of the, the, big, the big features in helping to explain uh, uh, some of the trends running across public education. Um, but, but um, you know, I, I think that, that one of the things that we're seeing, for, you know, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the mainstream debate, you know, about, about um, rep you know, countless reports being put out about the, the newspapers sort of talking about education. I mean, there's a movie, right, right? you know, Waiting for Superman comes out, is, is as this issue becomes sort of focused on in a mainstream way, um, we're seeing education, so access to education being dressed up in civil rights clothing in a way that's really done a real flip on, on how, how the way we traditionally think about school. And, and, and I want to just take a minute before I get into the specifics of Chicago to sort of unpack that a little bit. Um, so the demand for access to high quality school talked about in terms of the schools should have an atmosphere of discipline, they should have good teachers, there should be access to technology, most of all those schools should produce results. And those things all seem, you know, logical enough. Um, it, 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 and then the argument then shifts parents who demand access to these kind of schools should have a choice about where their students should be able to go to school, where the kids should be able to go to school. Um, and the, the schools, frankly, that are delivering the, those, those choices, those high quality choices, are charter schools. Um, and that, and that, so like if you're a black or Latino student demanding a choice, that's a civil rights 
issue now, right? It's being posed in terms of, terms of racial equality. And people who stand in the way of that choice are standing in the way of civil rights, i.e. those self-interested adults, by which they mean uh, uh, people who defend, defend traditional public schools, um, teachers unions, etc. Please notice that this, the, this sort of the, this talking about education as a choice in which this sort of this high quality options are available is a complete turnaround from the way that we talked about educational access in the 1960s. Um, you know, the civil rights movement, of course, was all about access to education, right? I mean, it starts with Brown versus Board, 1954. You know, and it has three major components: that black students should have access to white schools. That is the desegregation of schools. Number two, it was about democratizing the curriculum and teaching culturally relevant materials. Frankly, to, to put blacks and Latinos back into the curriculum, right? Um, and finally, it was all in the context of government support for housing, for job training, for a series of anti-poverty programs, Medicare, et cetera. Um, and that taken as a whole, these education reforms, it's worth saying, were, were incredibly successful. The black-white education gap in this country between, say, the, you know, the, the very early 70s, when Johnson's anti-poverty programs really begin taking full effect, and say the mid-80s, halves the black-white education gap you, 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 across the board. Since then, it's declined or been flat um, since those programs were unwound. Um, in other words, all of the sort of hue and cry in the mainstream press about education as a civil rights issue as defined in terms of choice has actually not produced the same kind of results that the, that the 1960s were talking about education as, look, it's obvious, you know, if, if, if we live in a society in which white people are, are wealthier and have access to better things than black people, let black people go to white people's schools. That, that'll be a good test for us, right? Um, let's teach things that are culturally relevant. Let's support, the, let, let's support people who are living in poverty. Those basic ideas actually produce results. The, the stuff that we're doing now hasn't, hasn't been so successful. Um, Let's just, so let's, let's unpack it a little bit. Education is a human rights issue in Chicago. The Chicago public schools are intensely segregated. In fact, they're more segregated now than they were 20 years ago, um, despite the fact that our society as a whole is becoming less segregated. So um, I, I could go through it, but um, you know, the, seven in 10 African American students go to intensely segregated schools in Chicago. Um, the typical black student goes to a school has 90% where 90% of the students are on free and reduced price lunch, which is a, a basic measure of poverty. Typical, you know, uh, white students, uh, by contrast, 25% of white students go to schools where, um, uh, I'm sorry, white students typically go to schools that have 25% of the students on free or reduced price lunch. Um, the, the, the number of African American students on, on probation, uh, whose schools are on probation, which think about the term probation is applied to a school. Probation is, of course, a term that comes out of the criminal justice system. You know, um, in the, the probation policy in Chicago was started uh, under Paul Vallis in 1997. There were 100 schools on probation. Today, there's 300 schools on probation, about one and two schools on probation. And, and virtually every, um, well, not virtually, actually every um, general enrollment high school um, that has uh, uh, that's a, that's a minority school in Chicago is on probation, for example. So you know the, the entire lot of them are uh, on some kind of academic failure. We have an intensely segregated system. Charters, the, 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 I don't know if people are familiar with it, charters, the, the startup schools that are privately managed are worse. 85% of CPS students as a whole um, are, are non-white. 95% of charter uh, schools are non-white. You've got um, single-race charter schools like Perspectives, which is 92% African American. 11% of their teachers are white. I mean, are, are, are non-white. So 89% uh, uh, of their teachers are white. The vast majority of those are early in their teaching career. So, like, so not only do you have a segre segregating out of the system, the, the teachers that are being offered in these schools are actually younger less experience, and less likely to look like the students they're teaching. So that, that's what we mean by the kind of the, the picture of segregation. Um, the fact that schools, the, 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 so the, the picture then is that um, the, the schools are put into, are, are in Chicago right now are being put into competition. I, I wanted to talk about school closings because as people know, Chicago just voted, the Board of Education just voted to close 49 elementary schools in a high school program, 50 schools. It's the largest single school closing program in the history of the U.S. By the way, not by percentage. There's other school districts that have closed higher percentages of their schools. Um, St. Louis in, in uh, 09 and 10 closed half their schools. 
Um, but the, um, but the basically this, co this competition in the schools first presents itself as, uh, as, as competition around test scores. So schools with low test scores get put on probation and schools that are on probation that are eligible for closing. And now they don't call it, they, they, they have the academic tiers, so tier one, tier two, and tier three. And it was schools on tier three that were pr primarily targeted. Um, um, then the, the sort of the idea of the school reform the, of school reformers, Arne Duncan, of course, being the most famous one, he's not Secretary of Education, um, but you know, including Barbara Bennett, who's the who, who's the CEO now, is to then divert resources away from low school, schools that don't produce high gains in test scores, and, and and send those resources to schools that do a better job at tests. Right? That is, there's a market mechanism here at work. So you, you measure test scores, and then you, you, get, you, you starve the schools that aren't doing well. It's a simple enough idea. What it, its effect in the inner, cities, uh, inner city schools in Chicago, though, is that it means that st schools that have poor kids that don't do well. And by the way, um, uh, the education level of your parents is the single best predictor of, 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 of kids' test scores. I mean, really, all the research shows that. You know, you, you could do a better job predicting, um, you know, how kids are going to do by looking at the kinds of cars that are in the parking lot at drop-off and pick-up time than you, than you can by, um, for example, looking at the education level of the teachers, uh, sad to say. Um, but that, it wind, that winds up impacting the curriculum as schools work hard to try to raise their test scores. And so what schools tend to do in Chicago, as well as other places, is that they narrow the curriculum to the focus on test scores. And schools become test prep factories um, because of the incredible amount of anxiety and pressure uh, on that metric. And so go back to what I said was the sort of second feature of the civil rights movement, which was sort of the idea of democratization of curriculum and making schools be about teaching things that were culturally relevant and interesting to kids. And, and actually, we've achieved the exact opposite, sort of a, 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 a relentless drumbeat focus on the things that are taught on Pearson tests, on the ISAT, on the SA, ACT, et cetera. Finally, um, and, and I, I know I'm, I'm sort of on too long of an arc here. I'm going to have to um, uh, get a, okay, um, get a little more succinct. The, um, the other thing that we've seen happen is that is that public schools in many Chicago communities have become the repository of social services as sort of as a last resort. As over the last 20 years, we've seen the hollowing out of neighborhood public public health clinics. Um, <laughs> Decent libraries, um, social services, social work, um, you know, psychological counseling, a whole, whole series of, uh, of services for kids are now delivered in the school. Um, not universally or as well as they should be, but, um, but certainly the place where I taught, for example, Santa High School, I mean, you know, had a social worker, had a counselor, lots of students used both those services, and had a full service health clinic. You know, kids could get, for example, you know, like teen moms could get prenatal care. People could get um, treatment, you know, sort of counseling about how to, you know, you've got hypoglycemia or diabetes in the family, you know, basic teaching about health awareness, things that actually have a good social impact. Um, schools have come to be the repositories of those services. But the rest of our society is increasingly doesn't have any services along, along those lines at all. Housing would be a good example. Summer jobs, again, something which people might have talked about having, you know, had uh, 30 years ago or, or really now. It was the single most common question when I was in a classroom. Kids would come up to me and say, Mr. Sharkey, can you help me find a job? Um, uh, people need work. It, then if you think about it, then um, the, the school closing, the arguments about school closings in Chicago become extremely pernicious. Because, because one of the, the, the sort of the arguments here is that these schools are underutilized. Well, that's partly, you know, there, there's some truth to that. There, are, there, are, uh, there were a lot of schools, and continue, there continue to be a lot of schools in Chicago that have fewer students than the school was, was built, to, it was intended to house when the school was built. Part of that is that, like, old schools, you know, are built with 56 desks, you know, in a room bolted to the floor, and that's not the way we do school anymore. But part of that is just the fact that there's been some demographic changes in the city of Chicago. That's true. But what... But what's but there's two really kind of nasty features to the story that we're being told that that really need to be unpacked a little bit. W one is that the 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 districts 
numbers for what a fully utilized school was didn't include things like smaller special education classrooms, which are part of the law, didn't include things like science labs and parent resource rooms and all the kinds of things, you know, art classes and all the kinds of things which aren't homerooms, which don't pack kids into the school, but which frankly a high functioning school needs to have. And so if you go, if you look for example at the school that um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg sends his kids to in New York, it's a 700 student school. So according to the formula, it should have 5.6 special rooms. It actually has 24 special rooms. So you know it has almost 500% more rooms than it should have under the formula. CPS schools that had that kind of school util room utilization rate would be closed under this last round. So that's the first point. The second point is that, is that, that it's not at all clear that closing schools at the same time that they're opening non-union charter schools, uh, you know, sort of uh, all around the city, that it is going to have the effect of uh, actually preserving a public a student body in public education. It, it'll, it'll have the opposite effect of that. Um, we, I mean, we, we know for a fact that when they close schools, they lose students. People say, "I'm not, you know, I'm frustrated by the choices that I have." Um, Charter schools in the city of Chicago, uh, which ba barely existed a decade ago, um, now enroll about 55,000 students. Um, there's about 100 charter schools. Chicago just signed the Gates Compact, which is going to call for the creation of 60 more charter schools in, within the next four years. So, there, so it is true that they're closing public schools very rapidly, but they're opening other publicly funded but privately managed schools at the same time they're doing that. Um, it's sort of, I mean, it, it's the district in a way admitting that it's giving up on the project of a universal compulsory public education for everybody. And that's, that's really what's going on here. And saying, no, what, what, what providing a good education is really going to mean is we're going to provide lots of choices. And as long as people have a choice, that's going to that's gonna substitute for, the, for the, the, the need to be able to provide a good school. See the difference there? You're providing a choice, not necessarily providing a, a good school. In fact, they're closing down many schools. Uh, you know, people probably didn't invite me here because of my brilliant analysis. I probably was invited here because people have heard of the CTU and are aware that this, that about, about some of the, the, the things that have happened uh, um, in this city. And, and I, I do want to talk about that briefly, um, which is to say that, like, from the beginning, the, the you know I was a public school teacher an educator first and in some ways you know that the being part of running this union is a drag and, I, and I'll be happy to go back to being a, a classroom teacher um, uh, you know when the time comes for that but but I will say that like the the, the entry into this sort of the, the the narrative in Chicago about schools of public educators has been extremely important uh, in this city because what we've done is we've said very clearly that that Public school teachers, clinicians, paraprofessionals, have a common cause with people who depend on public schools. And, it's, and, and the public education system is worth defending and, 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 defend, and actually being active about. And we've attempted to create a movement in the city on that basis that says it, it's not okay that, like, that we have segregated school s conditions in Chicago. And it's not okay there's 160 schools in the city of Chicago without libraries or librarians. You know, that's not the way that, like, people who are wealthy, um, ex you know, experience education. Why should, why should that be okay in the city of Chicago? Um, you know, we, we've spoken out about sort of the, the, the shrinking number of social services that are available to kids. Um, we've made demands about defending class size. Class size in the city is, is, is ballooning, by the way. Um, it's spiking. And the school closings are going to make it a lot worse. Chicago is in the 90th percentile statewide for class size. And one of the reasons for that is just because the, the law, which says that, that school districts have to bargain over class size, um, uh, doesn't hold true for Chicago. So there's, there's one district in the city, which the, 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 the state educational code says, you know, in any school district over, you know, having continuous borders that's over, over 500,000 people, i.e. just Chicago, um, you, you know, the, the district doesn't have to, like, actually observe class size limits. So they can set a policy, and if they want to change the policy later, they will. And that, that became an issue in the strike. And so what, what we think we... The pattern that we've seen is an erosion of a public school system that's well-funded, that's committed to sort of essentially some civil rights principles, that's attached to some civil, attached to some social services that can actually provide, that, that can actually provide the basis for educating poor kids. And we've seen we've seen a retreat towards a kind of a market story about about what's going to improve schools. 
Um, and that's put us at loggerheads with, with the people who run the city, um, frankly. And I don't um, have time to go into the, sort of the way that fight's played out. Um, I, people who watch the news, I'm sure, have seen it on the front pages of the newspapers. Um, I guess I would just say that it's not over. That there's that there's a, a lot of struggles in this arena left to play out, and um, I, for one, am very committed to the ideal of a high quality public education for everybody. Um, I, I do think that that's a human right for students. Um, I don't think that um, the the market provides real solutions. Um, you know, go to the neighborhoods on the west side. The market hasn't done a very good job providing for restaurants. You know or high quality clothing stores or a whole set of other things, you know, it hasn't even provided for sidewalks for God's sakes. Um, the last remaining institution in a lot of those neighborhoods was schools and we've just closed 50 of them. Um, and that motivates me to keep fighting for better education for everybody. Thanks. There's no more seats, but there's like space if you wanted to sit on the floor by the windows or something. There's a couple chairs. Or come up here. Are there seats near anybody? Are there chairs over here? There's a couple seats over here. Yeah. Thanks. David Moberg. Uh, I'm going to uh, come at this from a slightly different uh, perspective and talk a bit more about privatization. Uh, and its uh, history and some of the debates about it, ending up talking about uh, some of my observations about the uh, school campaign, uh, the ongoing fight, including the strike, the uh, fight against school closings. Uh, the, uh, so uh, pr privatization uh, is a current uh, term in use for part of a long-standing uh, process of trying to define the public and private spheres in society. And uh, you know, at, at one point, uh, a lot of uh, cities had private firefighting uh, uh, apparatus. And uh, if people uh, had a fire uh, in the neighborhood and somebody hadn't subscribed to the service, uh, the building could just burn down and, of course, burn down buildings next to it. And it became obvious to a lot of people that it made sense just to cover everybody and have uh, uh, firefighters uh, take care of all fights. And uh, so the, there's no magic balance uh, in terms of, of my pad of paper, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> or me. Uh, that uh, one could strike. There's uh, oftentimes uh, pragmatic questions like I just talked about that uh, can help determine uh, what makes sense to be public and what makes sense to be private. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of ideology and values that go into it and uh, often a question of uh, uh, class interests as uh, I'll talk some about. Uh, the uh, public uh, provision of services and uh, ownership of uh, assets like uh, uh, anything from parks to schools is associated with a number of uh, alleged virtues of uh, universal access, of uh, public accountability, uh, of a uh, kind of uh, community, stronger uh, sense of community. And it's also associated uh, uh, very much with the, the left, uh, whether socialists or social democratic uh, parties. Uh, and uh, the private provision of services and uh, ownership of uh, assets is obviously much more associated with uh, business interests in society. And co consequently, because of this, partly because of this political background, uh, there's always, uh, within the last couple of centuries, has been a larger public sphere in most European countries, uh, a, a stronger uh, socialist and social democratic uh, political force there. But interesting also that the c conservative politicians in uh, Europe tend to have more of a sense of the importance of the state, and uh, you know rather than uh, emphasizing a redistrib redistributive policies, perhaps. 
they s see the state as important for as important for uh, social stability uh, and uh, for a kind of establishment of national community. I mean, after all, as most of you probably know that uh, Bismarck in Germany, uh, no leftist, uh, <laughs> was the first to introduce a public pension plan, uh, and. Uh, so there's, there, there is a difference uh, in part, especially between continental Europe and uh, the United States and uh, to some extent the, uh, uh, the uh, countries uh, from the old uh, English uh, colonies. Uh, the, uh, there, there's also a uh, ideological sense in this country of a greater belief in a free market uh, and a kind of deference to business, you know, the businessman is hero, uh, you know, certainly uh, was something that struggled against first an aristocratic tradition where they looked down on businessmen in Europe and, and then against a more uh, so socialist kind of uh, critique of business. Uh, so there's not the same kind of celebration of a Bill Gates or, or Lee Iacocca or uh, Donald Trump even uh, in, anywhere in Europe. So there's a much different kind of cultural uh, context. Uh, the, uh, uh, there also is, besides this ideology, a history in this country of being much more diverse uh, and the flip side of that is so we've had to contend with uh, a long history of racism and obviously before that slavery and anti-immigration uh, movements and a kind of fragmentation of the national community that conservatives uh, might identify with in, in, in Europe. In general, it's fair to say I think that the uh, public sector uh, increased uh, in importance throughout the uh, 20th century uh, up until uh, probably about the, uh, the 1970s. Uh, and p part of it uh, actually uh, was a result of uh, Cold War uh, competitive pressures, uh, m many uh, uh, kind of more social uh, public policies uh, were in instituted both in the United States and in, in Europe in part as a response to the, quote, communist threat uh, and to, uh, to uh, hold down uh, kind of uh, movements from the, uh, the, the left uh, in uh, Western Europe as well. The, uh, mm -hmm. I remember just apropos of that, uh, visiting the International Labor Organization uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and the ILO was founded, coincidentally, two years after the Russian Revolution. Uh, to, uh, to do something about labor standards. And this was, as uh, communism was beginning to unravel, the observation from uh, all the labor representatives at the ILO was that suddenly the business representatives were no longer interested in reaching any accommodation. So uh, some of that, uh, there, there are lots of reasons for that growth of uh, a public sector. But by the 1970s, there really was a, uh, a kind of backlash against the public with uh, stagflation uh, being blamed on uh, government regulation and a government uh, role, uh, uh, globalization beginning to put pressures uh, on uh, governments. And the responses from uh, Th Thatcher in England and Reagan uh, uh, shifted the whole uh, uh, temper of debate that government was not the solution but the problem. Uh, and at a local level, it took the form of such uh, mundane things as uh, looking to uh, private contractors to pick up garbage rather than have the public do it. Uh, globally, it coincided with a time when the International Monetary Fund, looking for uh, more work to do, uh, took on a greater role in the th uh, third world developing countries and began to develop the Washington con Consensus. Uh, which included, uh, among other principles, besides lower taxes and uh, deregulation, privatization of public services, privatization of uh, public assets. Uh, for example, uh, Western Europe, as many of you may recall, had 
steel mills, uh, coal mines, railroads, postal telegraph service, all sorts of things that uh, are at least uh, all are privately uh, owned in this country uh, were uh, for previously public and then pr privatized. So the, the push then from uh, global institutions was in favor of privatization. The, the push in terms of that kind of a uh, sense that uh, government uh, was responsible for uh, the uh, st stagnation of uh, many uh, economies uh, also pushed in that direction. Uh, and there was unleashed this kind of push from, first from uh, Republicans and increasingly uh, from Democrats as well uh, towards uh, more and more privatization uh, at all levels in this country. And there, just in terms of privatization, there are a couple of basic d divisions you can make. One is privatization of services, uh, like picking up garbage or delivering health care uh, or uh, providing education, which is a topic tonight. Uh, versus privatization of assets, like the uh, plan to uh, lease out uh, control over a midway airport, or the uh, privatization of the parking meters. <laughs> and, and sometimes th this privatization takes a complete privatization form, like in many third world countries where uh, under pressure the governments uh, sold off to private companies their water uh, treatment plants, for example. Uh, and uh, and uh, many times it takes the form of leasing, like the 99-year lease on the uh, uh, the parking meters. Uh, so the arguments, in brief, for and some counter arguments for uh, privatization are that it's often argued that it's cheaper, but often it turns out not to be cheaper in the long run because companies often lowball to get a contract and then raise prices. There's the expense of monitoring to make sure that the private uh, companies actually do what they said they, was going to, they were going to do. There's a price often of increased corruption. Uh, you have to pay for profits and higher management salaries. But the key is in almost all of these cases is that the workers who are doing the work are much, much less likely to be unionized and get paid much less and get fewer benefits. And so, Privatization comes with it at this price uh, of labor uh, rights. Uh, and it, similarly, there's argument that private businesses are more flexible. That is, they can get rid of their workers more easily. Again, an erosion of labor rights. Or an argument that, um, you know, uh, public managers really can't do the job. Well, hire better managers rather than fire the workers is one alternative. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and so it's an avoidance of uh, taking responsibility for a quality of public management. And there's the argument, well, you get better talent and skill. But there are lots of talented and skilled uh, people who work even at uh, salaries that t tend to be less than uh, average for uh, such positions and work for a government. And, uh, you know, I was just having a discussion with somebody about privatizing the airport and said, well, you know, they have a lot of experience. They can bring in a manager who and uh, knows how to manage airports uh, better. But I said, well, why can't the city hire the same manager? Uh, so the, the, the kind of arguments for privatization t tend to, uh, in, in general, fall into the category that business knows best uh, and uh, government should get out of the way. And uh, finally, one argument that's particularly nefarious is that businesses are able to do what politicians don't have the courage to do which is raise parking meter rates, or in the case of privatizing the tollways in Indiana, uh, which immediately then the private owner raised the uh, tolls there. Some arguments against privatization. Uh, in general, and this assumes that government is working well, and I'll get to that in a second, that it's more democratic, that there's accountability, transparency, universality, and that there's a kind of redistributive effect uh, of government that uh, is uh, argued in its favor. And that, in fact, that the public sector can act as a counterweight to uh, business practices and the bu private business model, and that maybe business is not the best model for delivering all kinds of services uh, in uh, society, that the public can be more egalitarian 
uh, and uh, can uh, take uh, pay more attention to the needs of the disadvantaged uh, to uh, minorities and uh, others who might get neglected in a market situation. And also there's the argument that in general there may be better treatment of workers and although uh, many uh, public officials like our mayor are uh, desperately trying to prove that that's wrong about uh, government, that in general that uh, in this country, at least, that workers have uh, fared much better trying to organize unions in the public sector than in the last several decades than in the private. Well, let me then just turn to some final points then about human rights and privatization, uh, and particularly about the Chicago. Uh, as a general rule, we think of human rights more in, in the terms of being participants in the general society or, the, or polity, uh, freedom of speech, of, ex, uh, of religion, of uh, other individual rights uh, that are part of our general sphere. But there are also human rights that specifically apply to, uh, to the workplace. To, to la labor rights are an important part of human rights. Uh, and uh, that's one important point to keep in mind when we talk about privatization. Both dimensions are uh, affected. And it's also important to remember that both government and private businesses can violate, private organizations of all sorts, can violate human rights. Uh, there's a strong tendency to think of tyrannies as violating people's human rights. But uh, for many people, going to work each day is a bit of a tyranny. Uh, and uh, th there uh, certainly have most people at work have, do not have freedom of speech, for example. Uh, but it's also true that in defense of government provision of services or ownership of assets, uh, the, the argument about you know, transparency, democracy, accountability only makes sense if the government is indeed functioning in that way. Uh, so I, I, in terms of the kind of broad topic of the the evening, I, I, my argument would be that privatization d does not inherently violate human rights, uh, but that in practice privatization has had a tendency, especially in this country, to in increase inequality. Uh, that in uh, maybe most noticeable in other countries, I, I think of, of places like uh, uh, Latin parts of Latin America where uh, water works were privatized and the uh, uh, cost of water went up dramatically and poor people uh, could no longer afford such a basic uh, commodity as water, uh, that not only has it increased the inequality but uh, really d diminished uh, access to uh, essentials of life. And uh, the uh, so I think that uh, on the whole that the privatization has d uh, d diminished uh, uh, accountability, transparency, and equality uh, and, and community. And many of those uh, show, conditions show in uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, one of the things that's noteworthy I think about Chicago in, in general is that it's really uh, since um, second Mayor Daley has uh, been uh, one of the more aggressive uh, cities in privatizing uh, its, uh, its services uh, and, uh, and also in privatizing assets. And uh, Rahm Emanuel seems to have adopted that with uh, uh, perhaps increased uh, fervor. Uh, and uh, the, the educational system uh, is simply one very important uh, part of that whole uh, trend. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, what we see from the Chicago school experience is the uh, emergence of a, an unusual uh, movement, uh, unusual by contemporary standards for the labor movement in this country as well, unfortunately, fortunately it's taking place here, is that it is really expanded beyond the workplace and has taken on the, the issues of uh, 
the impact of what teachers are doing, uh, their role in society, uh, alliance, uh, forming alliance with uh, the uh, parents and students and community in, in a way that uh, is quite remarkable and uh, uh, you know, shows the way in which pushing for the rights of labor and the rights of uh, people in the general community uh, can uh, mesh together in a powerful way. Uh, I think one of the things that, that I find particularly interesting in the political battle over the schools has been the way in which caring about the kids is sort of the rhetorical pivot point of the battle. And there's hardly a press conference that Mayor Emanuel doesn't you know, make clear that I'm here talking about the kids. And not that the kids ever appointed him to do that, but you know, it's his right as a politician to uh, to make that claim. And of course, the parents and teachers are making the same sort of claim. Uh, and the rights of kids to an education is clearly a human right. But what, how is that human right implemented? And that's one of the limitations, that I think, of the human rights uh, uh, dialogue to some extent, is that we have here both sides claiming that they're interested in the rights of kids, essentially, uh, rights of children to uh, education. But clearly there's a, a, a big difference in terms of the approach. And there's a lot of data that can be mustered, uh, you know, I think weighing on the behalf of the teachers union uh, for the most part. Uh, and uh, you know, as, a, as a criticism of the corporate privatized uh, model. But nevertheless, it's, it's an indication of important as the kind of focus on rights is that there are some limits to it. And, uh, uh, Finally, two, two, two points. One, uh, sort of uh, undercutting the argument for rights and another uh, in favor of the use of the rights rhetoric. Uh, it's pretty clear when you look at the situation that there, and Jesse was laying out much of it, that there's a, a sharp uh, kind of class dimension to the, the battle. Uh, the uh, poorest kids are the ones who are uh, losing out in, in part because they're judged as being uh, least likely to succeed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, so the investment of resources there is uh, least efficient. Uh, you can just look at the people who are pushing the, uh, the agenda, even within the Democratic Party. So uh, P Penny Pritzker, uh, our soon to be new uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, who is you know, the, the billionaire looking out for the poor kids. Uh, the, uh, and right down the line, I mean, a lot of these people you know, espouse decent values, but they look at the world from a peculiarly, peculiar angle. I mean, it is peculiar to have a couple billion dollars, so that, I mean, almost by definition. That sort of changes the way you look at things a bit. Uh, and to be accustomed to running large corporations like the Hyatt Corporation, where you regularly subcontract in order to get cheaper uh, housekeepers, uh, even if that means getting rid of your union, uh, or their, their union. So there is a kind of class uh, dimension uh, that uh, also enters in here you know, uh, that uh, goes beyond simply the, uh, the language of rights. But finally, and I will wrap up with this, there has been a lot of kind of ambiguous talk in recent years about sort of a right to the city. Uh, and in a way, uh, what uh, is happening with the uh, uh, movement to uh, stop the closings and to uh, the alliance between uh, teachers and the community is an assertion of something more than having neighborhood schools and having uh, their ki ki kids uh, have what they consider a, a decent education. But it is a, a claim on the city that they have a right to have the means to live a, a decent life. That, and it ties into education in the sense that education alone is not going to tackle the inequalities in this uh, society. Uh, 
uh, as uh, Jesse was uh, quoting the statistics about correlation of success in education. We have to make deliberate steps towards reducing the objective levels of inequality in the society for education to be able to even have much effect. And so we have to work on both ends, both improving education, but also not leaving it up to resolving all questions of inequality, but act directly on it. And one of the things that I see emerging in this fight against privatization uh, is a movement uh, against uh, inequality much more broadly. Hi, good evening. Um, my students know I'm not used to speaking sitting down, but I'll see what I can do. Um, welcome, and I'm very pleased um, as head of the Human Rights Program to see how many people, particularly from beyond the campus, have come to, come to this program, and our thanks to CAN-TV because now this discussion will be in living rooms all over the city of Chicago, sometimes at three o'clock in the morning, but um, I think it'll be good that we can get our words beyond these walls. Um, I'm not going to talk about education and privatization so much as I want to talk about the fundamental mental notion of a human right to education. And first I'm going to tell you a little story that helps us understand how we relate what happens at these United Nations agencies far away in Geneva to the south side of Chicago. So here goes. Just after the UN was founded in 1945, Eleanor Roosevelt was tapped to head a commission to draft a document which would sets international standards for civil, political, social, and economic rights. In other words, human rights for the world. And this is the document that later becomes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois, and I don't think I have to tell this audience who Du Bois was, was paying attention to this. He had been at the founding conference of the United Nations in 1945 five, having persuaded the U.S. State Department that civil society organizations from across the U.S., including particularly African American groups, Jewish organizations, and other faith communities, should be present when the United Nations was setting up a new world order. And now, as the Human Rights Commission was starting to do its work, he was determined that the situation, the deplorable situation of African Americans in the United States be brought to international attention. He persuaded the NAACP, where he was working at the time, to back his plan, and he assembled a team of five authors to write a document which is later called An Appeal to the World. An Appeal to the World sets out the situation of political exclusion, racist violence, lack of access to education, health care, and labor rights for African Americans. When Du Bois and his team completed and presented this document to the United Nations, Eleanor Roosevelt was furious. She was straddling a difficult line in trying to keep a U.S. Congress dominated by segregationists from pulling the United States out of the United Nations altogether and had to engage in some real political gymnastics in order to keep the U.S. involved. So she did what she could. She resigned from the board of the NAACP which really scared the NAACP's executive director, Walter White, and eventually, over the next several months, White agreed to completely abandon any effort to bring the conditions of African Americans to an international community, and Du Bois left the NAACP. Now, there are other efforts um, in the period in the early 50s to bring um, the conditions of African Americans to the attention of the United Nations, most notably a petition called We Charge Genocide, which was brought to Paris by William Patterson from the National Negro Congress. The effort to bring these issues to a UN meeting in Paris is what cost Paul Robeson his passport, and gradually these efforts died out. But in January 2012, when I was teaching a course about the practice of human rights and looking at the Chicago police torture cases, I decided I wanted to find out a little bit more about how African Americans had tried to bring their condition to international attention, and lo and behold, in the stacks at Regenstein Library, I found a copy of An Appeal to the World. It hadn't really been distributed by the NAACP after they renounced it. There are apparently some copies in a few um, where Du Bois's papers are in Western Massachusetts, but it's not a document that's generally available online. And when I opened it up, I discovered on the first page 
and this is what give, brings this home to Chicago, that two of the five authors who Du Bois enlisted to write an appeal to the world were prominent African Americans from the south side of Chicago. Earl B. Dickerson, who was the first African American graduate of this law school, and later the head of Supreme Life, and the lawyer who brought the end of racially restrictive covenants in the case of Hansberry versus Lee in the Supreme Court, and William Ming, who was the first African American faculty member at the University of Chicago Law School, a fact which made him, in fact, the first African American professor at any non-black law school in the United States. So Ming and Dickerson were two of the chapter authors who helped Du Bois bring the conditions of African Americans in the US in the late 1940s to the attention of the world. We stand on their shoulders today. Now, there has been a long decline, there was a long decline in US social justice groups using the United Nations as a forum for talking about domestic issues. It partly had to do with the complicated history of the Cold War and the strength of a doctrine which we can call American exceptionalism, which was real hostility to international monitors of any sort looking at domestic conditions in the United States. Now, given a resurgence of interest in human rights, organizations like the US Human Rights Network, the Midwest Coalition for Human Rights, and others, we have seen more of a use by US social justice organizations in bringing contemporary issues, American issues, to international human rights bodies. But there still is a very strong strain of American exceptionalism alive in this country, most recently manifested in the rejection by the US Senate of the ratification of an international treaty on the rights of the disabled, which is based almost entirely on American law. And I think the best reporting on the absurdity and cruelty of the Senate's rejection of this treaty was actually done by John Stewart in The Daily Show. So if you want to see a really good critique of how American exceptionalism harms human rights in the United States, you should Google Daily Show Disability Rights Treaty and you'll get it straight from John Stewart. Now, what is the right to education? What are our ideas of rights in the United States? Well, I think the current struggle that Dave and Jesse laid out is really a fundamental struggle over the legacy of the New Deal. What is it that we expect from the state? President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was forced in the 1930s and 40s by progressive political movements, including labor unions, to forge a vision of the state that included guaranteed access to all factors necessary for fundamental human dignity, including education, healthcare, et cetera. And although he talked about this need for a second Bill of Rights in his last inaugural, he never was able to bring this to fruition within the US. But his wife carried through, to say some good things about Eleanor Roosevelt, I don't want to paint an entirely negative picture of her, this notion that civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights were all fundamental rights and needed to be established as universal international standards. Our ideas of rights in the United States don't include a right to education or a right to health care or a right to food. When we look at our domestic law, we have some very good guarantees of civil and political rights in the Bill of Rights. And the post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, established the right to be free from racial discrimination in the United States. Of course, it has cost decades and decades of struggles to make the Constitution speak the truth. But the basic document we have is a pretty good one, although rather incomplete. What do we get when we think about the meanings of rights if we turn to international human rights? Well, the US has not ratified certain treaties. I think a lot of you know that we are the only nation in the world, with the exception of Somalia, that has not ratified the Children's Rights Convention. And, there are, and as I said, we just re rejected the dis disability rights treaties. But there are a lot of documents that we can look at when we're thinking about what do we mean when we talk about a right to education. I think probably the foremost principle that reads across all of these documents is that family wealth should not determine access to quality education. And that is certainly a reality that many people are living in the United States today. We can take a lot of sets of facts and fashion them into an understanding of how the right to education has been limited, but we haven't quite organized it yet. But if you want to think about things like 
High dropout rates, what does that say about the quality of education? The school closings and some statements by some parents that they're just going to keep their children out of school because they're afraid for their lives to send them to the districts where they have been designated to go by the Board of Education. Cutbacks, overcrowding the lack of arts education, the lack of music education, a deterioration of conditions, and the gloss of racial discrimination that goes over all of this, which is that ch children of color are far more impacted by this. Now let me just, I thought in the, it's almost in the nature of you know, the opening benediction at a meeting before we start our discussion, I want to just read you a little bit of the language that you hear in international human rights documents about the right to education so you can have some understanding of what these international and universal standards are. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone has the right to education. Education shall be free at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. Elementary education shall be compulsory. Technical and professional education shall, may, shall be made generally available, and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. Second paragraph, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality. And then I'm not gonna read every word, and the last article, last subsection of the article in the Universal Declaration says, parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. So both children and parents have rights in the UDHR to which the US is a party by virtue of its ratification by the UN in 1948. Now we are also a party to the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which we can use if we wanted to do something in the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. And this is a body of the Organization of American States, so I'm gonna read you, and because it's rights and duties, it sounds a little different than what you hear in the UDHR. Article 12, every person has the right to an education, which should be based on principles of liberty, morality, and human solidarity. Likewise, and this is important to think about when we're thinking about the quality of education, Every person has the right to an education that will prepare him to attain a decent life, to raise his standard of living, and to be a useful member of society. The right to an education includes the right to equality of opportunity in every case, in accordance with natural talents, merit, and the desire to utilize the resources that the state or community provides. Every person has the right to receive free at least a primary education. So those are the rights. In the duty section, it's very interesting that it places a duty on parents. It is the duty of every person to aid, support, and educate his minor children. And it is the duty of every person to acquire at least an elementary education. Now these, these are really rights of substance that talk about fundamental human dignity. And if we want to start thinking about the changes in public education that we've been seeing in the last two decades and three decades in the city, I think we begin to understand that the right to education is much more fundamental, broader, and visionary than how you score on certain standardized tests. It really has to do with what Jesse was talking about, about the development of your capabilities and the development of your entire capacity as an adult to earn a living and contribute to society. So I'm just gonna read you two more excerpts from human rights treaties and then I think I can wrap it up pretty quickly after that. I set my timer and then forgot to start it. Virginia, how am I doing with time? Okay. Um, we, the U.S. Is, a part, is in fact a party, we've both signed and ratified the International Covenant for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And that's known as the ICERD, and what the ICERD says at Article 5, state parties undertake to prohibit and to eliminate racial discrimination in all its forms and to guarantee the rights of everyone, including the right to take part in government as well as in the conduct of public affairs at any level. Think about the fact that we have an appointed, not elected school board in this city. It also includes the right to form and join trade unions and the right to education and training. So the ICERD guarantees against racial discrimination in the right to education. 
Now, the last treaty I'm going to read you a couple of lines from is one that the U.S. signed during the Clinton administration but has not been put to the Senate for ratification. This is the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It's got some wonderful language in it. Now, because we've signed it but not ratified it, the U.S. government is not exactly obligated to obey it, but on the other hand, because we've already signed it, we're not supposed to be acting in ways that are contrary to the principles in the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Treaty. So here we go. Article 13, the state's parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to education. They agree that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and the sense of dignity, and shall strengthen the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. They further agree that education shall enable all persons to participate effectively in a free society. And then I'm going to skip a little bit. Primary education shall be com compulsory and available to all. Secondary education shall be made available and accessible to all by every appropriate means. Higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity, meaning I don't get to study violin if I'm tone deaf, but you know, I should have access to develop my capacities by every appropriate means. Fundamental education shall be encouraged and intensified as far as possible for those persons who have not received or completed the whole period of their primary education, in other words, adult literacy. And then this is the section that I was reading to Jesse <laughs> before we started says that the material conditions of teaching staff shall be continuously improved. That's a part of the right to education are good conditions for teachers. And then the last is where parents come in. States parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for the liberty of parents to choose for their children's schools which conform to minim such minimum educational standards as may be laid down or approved by the state to ensure the more religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. In other words, this is put in to allow parents who do want an unconventional education for their children, particularly people who might be part of fundamentalist religions, to be able to have certified by the state the means of educating their children. So it gives parents a certain amount of power over their choice, children's choice and options of schools. So the last thing I want to then talk about very briefly is what could we do with all of these things? Well, US, we have some experience here in Chicago in taking the Chicago police torture cases to various international entities. We, together with the People's Law Office, the MacArthur Justice Center, our human rights program here, the Midwest Coalition for Human Rights, and Black People Against Police Torture, we took the, the Burge cases, as they're collectively known here in Chicago, to a hearing before the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, to the United Nations Committee Against Torture, we were part of a shadow report to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, and we had a visit to Chicago by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of People in the African Diaspora. And in all of those fora, it gets very interesting. Why do social justice advocates bring issues to these international fora? And across the board, whether we're talking about conditions in the city of Chicago or in countries around the world, it's usually because the politics and power relations of their domestic political system are closed and don't allow them the kinds of options and remedies that they're looking for. And so for us, when we worked on the Chicago police torture cases, we would be in a forum where the judge from Morocco, who was a commissioner on the UN Human Rights Commission, had no idea who Richard J. Daly was or Richard M. Daly and didn't really care and was going to decide this case on the merits as to whether the Chicago police had committed torture and not be concerned about the power of the Cook County Democratic Party. It was a real eye-opener for us. The other thing that bringing these cases to the International Forum did is it gets, it embarrasses the U.S. government. Just the way Eleanor Roosevelt was embarrassed by Du Bois bringing an appeal to the world to the UN Human Rights Commission, when you go to these international fora, whether it's in Washington at the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, which is in the OAS headquarters, or in Geneva before one of these UN committees, the parties who are there representing the United States are the State Department. And they're sitting there, this is what happened in the Chicago case, is going, what the hell is going on in Chicago? This is extremely embarrassing for us. And they called Washington, and Washington, the Justice Department, called Patrick Fitzgerald, our then U.S. attorney, and said, 
what's going on in Chicago that human rights advocates are embarrassing us in front of the United Nations about torture in Chicago. So having had some experience on this path of trying to figure out how we can use these international fora to open up and broaden the terms of the debate and bring some interest from other places and express our commonality with communities that are also going through issues related to deterioration of public education, privatization, and increasing gaps between the haves and have-nots in terms of what kinds of fundamental education one can find for one's children. I think we ought to begin to think about Chicago in its international context, and we can have some discussions over the next couple of months of some complaints or some processes that we might be able to do in order to bring some more international attention to what's going on in our dearly beloved city. Thank you. Um, I had just a few comments before we open it up to Q&A. Um, one thing that really struck me, although I'm sure it was implied or maybe was said in our three speaker statements, was that great D word, democracy. And I think that this is a fundamental issue and question that we all have to ask ourselves when we are posed with the solution of privatization. Um, so Jesse was talking about choice and how this has been the driving, uh, the driving, I guess, sort of mantra almost uh, in these debates. There's a great book by Jeffrey Hennig called Rethinking School Choice, The Limits of the Market Metaphor, where he really unpacks a lot of what Jesse was talking about. Um, and one thing that he raises is why does choice trump democracy? Um, why does, and, and he's saying, right, I absolutely believe in individual choice and this is important, but what about collective choices about a good society and what kind of society we want to live in and how we collectively engage then in making that real? Um, and so I think mm -hmm. that that's something that's really critical here and of seeing the public sector as a part of democratic process. It is a place where the public sector is accountable, right, directly accountable through the democratic system to us. And this is one reason why I would argue it's better, that I can hold, it's very hard, right, in this day of age to hold these politicians accountable, but we can, at least in theory, do it. When we privatize services, when we privatize these rights, the, the, our, the means by which we substantiate rights, we lose that kind of accountability. So I think that that's central. The second point I wanted to make was a point about labor rights. Um, Jesse talked about the trend of the closing gap and the black-white educational gap on the heels of the civil rights movement um, through the 80s, and then it's either plateaued or in some ways declined. That's exactly the same pattern when you look at uh, what I look at in my research, black-white wage inequality. It exactly mirrors it. And I would argue it's for exactly the same reasons. In my work, I talk about the, pe the peculiar political sensitivity of the African-American position in our society. That African-Americans have needed the intervention of the state in order to address gross discrimination and inequality. They are, though, also at great risk, too, to political shifts and tides. And one example I'll give you is in the federal government, we see um, very low rates of black-white wage inequality, uh, except during the 80s uh, through the Reagan administration. And that's that kind of political sensitivity. It can go either way. But I think it's something that's important to think about because in my uh, work, I argue that the real, uh, the, the black middle class is built on the public sector. And largely that's because of black employment in the public sector. The public sector is a, most, uh, is a more robust enforcer of anti-discrimination policies and practices. So there just it levels the playing field, right? Um, we see much better anti-discrimination policies and practices compared to the private sector. It also respects, it, this has been under fire late, lately, but historically has been, uh, although this is a recent history since the 60s, respects workers' right to organize, right? And so that's why the unionization rate in the public sector is 
and it's 6% in the private sector, which is as low as it's been. The last time it was this low was in 1916, before the New Deal, right? Before the modern, what we consider the modern welfare state. So those two things, the public sector as a more robust enforcer of anti-discrimination, plus African-American workers' ability to unionize is what is largely responsible for the black middle class today, especially in urban areas like the city of Chicago. And lo and behold, where do most of those public sector workers work? They work in schools. So this is where the two are intrinsically uh, connected. Uh, and this is where I would argue that, right, the working conditions of these teachers are directly correlated to the educational conditions of students. Why they're pitted against one another, I, it's, it's, it's so hard for me to even understand that argument. I mean, I'm sure I need to go through it. But we see where workers have a more stable, right, existence, where they have rights on the job and a voice, right? This is incredibly important. Isn't that what democracy is? A voice. Unions are about making democracy real, not only in the community, but also uh, at the workplace. And this is my favorite factoid that I'm gonna end with. The only nonprofit organization that's federally mandated, mandated to, be, to be run democratically is a labor union. It's the only nonprofit organization in the United States that's mandated by the federal government to be run as a democratic organization. I, place my trust in democratic process. I want my teachers, right, to be able to self-organize through a democratic process. I want to be able to make decisions about a collective vision of a good society through a democratic process. Now we have a mic that Clarence is going to pass around. And we have, I think if people want to stick around, we can extend time. I'm not sure we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. I'd just like to pick up on your last point. Could you um, identify yourself? I'm sorry, my name is John Murphy. I'm a community resident. My children attended Chicago Public Schools, but I have none now. <laughs> um, the last point you picked up about racism and relating that to privatization. Uh, where is the movement in Lake Forest, the home of great corporate leaders for privatization of their, <laughs> their school system? Uh, where in the white suburbs do we see uh, you know, that kind of threat? Uh, and how is it that it's Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, and, and Washington, D.C., where these movements are most likely to, to be seen? Tax base. Uh, there's no big push to, pri uh, to charterize schools in the suburbs. I mean, it's one of the funny things about choice is that people aren't clamoring for choice in the suburbs. There's only one school to go to there. It just happens to be a very good one. <laughs> right. Hi, thanks for everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I have two questions for Mr. Sharkey, and you can pick whichever one you think is most interesting to start with. Um, number one, I appreciated Mr. Moberg's uh, analysis showing how the rhetoric of business knows best really internal, like made people take as given that anything that's public service is bureaucratic and inefficient. And so now we have privatization across the board. So we see that happening in schools. And I'm wondering, society as a whole now seem to take as given that Public schools are inefficient, they're wasting money, teachers are against students. What is the CTU doing to challenge that rhetoric? And then my second question is, I happened to listen to um, NPR when the voting had come out about the school closing, and they had taken a few callers, and the callers had said, you know what, welcome to the real world, teachers. Like, this is what the private market is like, you lose your job in a minute, this is just how it is, and they need to stop complaining. So I'm also wondering what they're doing about this rhetoric in the private sector of like, the, what is it, the race to the bottom, um, saying this is just how it is for everyone else, so you know, suck up and deal with it. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do as a union is point out, is point out that there's some real misinformation. Um, you, I mean, you could even call d deliberately construed misinformation as lies um, uh, about charter schools. And I, I just, for example, um, there's, a, there's a line that says that charter schools outperform traditional public schools. 
but they never, no one ever takes the time to explain how public schools actually work in Chicago, because there's three kinds. There's ones you have to test, you have to take a test in order to get into, right? Soccer from schools. There's ones you have to apply to get into, right? And there's ones who you just get into, that is, they cannot keep you out of. And anyone want to make a guess about which the worst performing schools are? The ones that like you, they can't actually, you can't be kept out of. Now, it is true that if you, if you, charter schools are schools you have to apply to get into. And in many cases, there's fairly rigorous application processes. You have to apply months in advance, nine months before the school year starts. Your parent has to go in for an interview. You have to agree to sign you know, a series of conduct codes and, and raise money and participate in the school in a number of ways. If you compare that school to a school that you can't, keep, you can't kick somebody out of, guess what? It does better. Right? But if you compare that school to the analogous public school, that is schools that people have to apply to get into, in Chicago called magnet schools, guess what? The magnet schools actually do much better. Um, and, you know, I don't know if people can see the little graph. I mean, they do better in every, in every, in every category. Um, and that, by the way, has been found by all the big studies, by the Department of Education study under Rod Page, which was the Secretary of Education under George Bush. So, you know, you can't have to use that as being a, a union propaganda piece. It's that, that's, that's been found by um, the big credo study out of Stanford. But, by, you know, that, that research is pretty conclusive. Um, now, I, I, I guess... Um, you know, as of like the, you know, teachers, this is kind of, this is the way of the world, you know, tough up. I, you know, that's the kind of thing that's easy to say when it's somebody else's children's school being closed. I, I mean, it really is. Think about like your own child and imagine your child being in an environment that was fraught with dangers, you know, where there were gangs and there was violence and, you know, we, I mean, what, th how many students got shot last year in Chicago? 300? Did you know that 300 school students got shot in the city of Chicago last year? I mean, they didn't all get killed, but like, you know, that's, that's kind of risky, right? And imagine that's the environment that your kid is in, and there's, the school is the, is, the, is the most stable institution in your neighborhood. It's a place where there's caring adults that go every day. It's secure. It's a well-cupped up building. It's got social services in it, maybe. Maybe not enough, but like if, to the extent that they're anywhere, they're there. Um, and now someone says, well, we've, we've got figures here that show that you're not using enough of your rooms. Never mind where my children go to school, where they use even less of the rooms, but that's different. Where your children go to school, they're not using enough of the rooms. Now, I could change the attendance boundaries so the wealthy white area that's near your school could send its extra kids over there, or I could put a new program in your school, or I could advertise like the charter schools do, but I'm not going to do any of those things to actually increase the enrollment in your school. I'm going to close your school. And the people who actually depend on that institution, who keep the kids safe, didn't know their school was even on the list the day before it got announced. But they're in the media telling them that, you, that they have a plan to keep you safe. How can that be? And, and that, you, you know, and I'll say one last thing, because people say, well, what are the teachers, what are the teachers doing about it? Well, we're, we're doing tons. I mean, one thing we're doing is we're fighting to try to secure more resources for our schools. So we've been we've been pointing out that in Chicago there's a two there's a there's a quarter billion dollar year a real estate fund sledge fund called the TIF fund tax increment finances that are held in surpluses that don't that get taken out of the property tax base that don't go into the schools that should. Um, why don't they put that money back to the schools? Why don't they, they, they made a series of, of toxic uh, real estate um, uh, hedge, interest rate uh, hedges um, in 2008, think, you know, at 5.5%, the cost of, of borrowing capital is now close to 0%, but CPS continues to pay 5.5% on billions of dollars worth of loans has made no attempt to renegotiate those loans. The people who had the banks that gave the loans said they would be willing to renegotiate the loans with CPS, but CPS hasn't asked. It, you know, we, we point that out. We, we have, te the teachers and, and, and staff in these schools have gone into schools under tough conditions and, and have really worked as hard as we can to like make the schools work. Teachers spend $1,000 a year of their own money on supplies. Um, put in countless hours, the big University of Illinois study that came out, they said the average teacher works 58 hours a week in Chicago. You know, so all the, all the talk about, you know, short, short work is, is, is a bunch of crap. The truth of the matter is that we actually have, you know, put ourselves on the line to make schools work. And yet we're 
but precisely the ones that are being blamed for the quote-unquote failures, the people who are furthest away from the actual education of children and are closest to making large amounts of money. That's their business. And our, but the people who are actually in the business of educating kids are the ones that are getting uh, 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 really blamed for the, the, the failures of the education system. So I don't know if that, yeah, I got a lot of passion about that there. Um, right there in the back in the polka dots. Hi, uh, my name is Samantha. I'm a third year at the college. Um, so you talked about what the teachers are doing currently to make um, conditions better in the schools. I was wondering what resources or strategies um, are currently in place that you know the parents in the communities are utilizing um, since, like you said before, um, you know, the kids in those communities are largely seen as, you know, not likely to succeed, and so many outside groups tend to, are, you know, seeing them as a lost investment. So what uh, tools do the parents have? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I'll have the time to scratch the surface on that. Uh, y you know, one of the things we definitely know is that schools are better when parents are involved. One of the, the cool things about Chicago is there's actually a pretty strong law which, which mandates parental involvement. There's a thing called local school councils, and local school councils do a number of important things in schools, including hiring and firing the principal. So, um, however, when your school goes on probation, right, you, you, you lose the power to, uh, uh, to do that. And, um, and, in partic and then when in charter schools and other, um, and other sort of uh, schools that are run by private contractors, uh, AUSL is the big one, the Academy of Urban School Leadership, you, you lose the right to have a, a, a decision-making LSC altogether. So um, one of the things that we're doing is to hold on to our democratic rights as they currently exist in, in the schools. Um, we, we know that's actually a good educational reform. It's being taken away um, in, in many cases. There's a lot of other things to say. I, parents have been very involved in Chicago. For example, there's a campaign to try to get an elected representative school board. Um, there's a lot of there's, there's some campaigning about that. Um, you know, there's been uh, parents have, have been very parents are an active member members of this thing called the Gem Coalition. Um, there's a number of parents groups that are uh, that are uh, complaining about the misuse of, of high stakes standardized testing and the way that it narrows the curriculum uh, and, and distorts the way education works. Uh, I I can really only scratch the surface, but I will say that that. There's no way in which the educational movement in Chicago uh, isn't a movement that involves, you know, both parents and members of the community um, and, and educators. I want to make one small point because it comes from my area of specialty in a way I've been looking at this. Local school councils are one of the most democratic institutions that have ever been set up as public decision-making bodies in this state because parents get to participate because they are parents. There is no U.S. citizenship requirement to vote in a local school council. So immigrant parents have been very active in local school councils, and there's been some very hot politics at the local level in school districts that are predominantly immigrant communities, and it's been a very healthy exercise in family involvement with local schools, and that's, what it, that's partly what is at risk in this trend towards charters and um, privatization of schools, is a sort of very fundamental opening where people can express citizenship and accountability in a community that means a lot to them. I mean, talk about the American dream that your kids get a good education. And it's been a very unique enterprise here in Chicago. Hi, I'm Micah Utrecht. I'm an editor at Jacobin Magazine in, in these times with David. Um, Jesse, uh, you know, a lot of times the talk about, you know, it widely acknowledged, I guess, that teachers' unions are the primary obstacle to this kind of free market education reform agenda, which is why they're targeted so much, right? Why expansive charter schools and non-union and all that stuff. Um, and I, I would venture to say that the same is probably true of public sector unions generally, that those are the the primary obstacles to, um, you know, privatizing all kinds of public goods, right? Um, and the CTU has sort of been a real clear leading voice in, in preventing that in education in Chicago. But, um, you know, you all had to make some important changes within your own union in order to get your union to the place where it was willing to fight for those kind of things for, for public education. 
as a public good. So, um, and we don't really see much of that in many other teachers unions around the country. Um, and, and I would say the majority of public sector unions, you don't kind of see that same kind of fighting spirit around the country. So what do you think are the uh, prospects for that kind of um, fighting unionism that's you know, allied with community groups uh, that you all have constructed here in Chicago to spread around the country? Too many, it's a good question. Too many unions are sclerotic, you know, are, are decrepit, have, have, um, have narrowed their scope of responsibility to the, to the narrowest set of, of economic terms around their members. Uh, but the reality, though, is that people whose livelihoods are tied up in the delivering of public service a actually need to defend the public service in terms that the, everyone who benefits from the service can understand. And that's the only way that we have a chance to make a kind of a political alliance that says, you know, no, it, 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 actually, um, you know, making teaching work into contingent, low-paid work with no rights and no sense of respect on the job is actually n not a good strategy for sort of building up high-quality schools with dedicated educators that stay, that, that stay in the profession. Um, that, like, you, you, that, that in a way that our union has seen the, the fight for public education as being intimately tied up to its identity as a union. And, you know, that for us, I mean, in the first case, it required winning an election in which sort of, um, you know, the, the, you talk about our union being democratic. So we're now the we're now the third le we're now the third union fourth union leadership in the last 15 years. So there's been a lot there's been a lot of turnover. Um, you know, so but in the first instance, we had to win an election behind a program that looked like that, and then in the second instance, we had to cut our own salaries, um, stop a number of practices that were, you, you know, that, that we couldn't we couldn't defend, um, uh, hire organizers, um, hire a research department. We had a union that was very involved in professional development, very involved in the work of like uh, trying to figure out the best way to deliver, you know, lessons but never was willing to try to teach society some lessons about, about all the misinformation that was out there about public schools. So we, you know, our union undertook those steps and then frankly in a very energetic way went out into the community um, and started making a series of arguments about, the, about how all of our state, how all of our futures were tied up and how, and how public schools were the things that were at stake. Um, that's the way, that's the reason why you saw 20,000 people wearing red shirts in downtown Chicago. Um, is because, you know, over a period of time, you know, I think we'd convince people that that was a fight that we all had some stake in. Um, in terms of how, what the prospects of that are, I don't know. We'll see. I, I mean, I, I think I know that for a fact that Chicago wasn't the only place where free market reforms are coming dressed up as improvements for students when really they're anything but that. I mean, I, I know that's happening in uh, Philadelphia where they're on a school closing rampage. Uh, I know in Cleveland they just got rid of tenure for teachers for all practical intents and purposes. Now teachers only get raises if the principal says, I like you. Um, so the idea that you build up experience over time in your career is now virtually gone in Cleveland, you know, uh, and, and that, that furthers your career that's gone in Cleveland now. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're just seeing privatizing. The, the public school system in New Orleans is basically no more. I, you know, they, they've charterized the entire thing. And so I, I, I think that it, the, 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 the environment is ripe for, for some of these kind of, um, uh, for some of these kind of directions. I, you know, we've been, we've been working very hard to sort of make Chicago work. Um, maybe David has some insight into where this thing is headed nationally. Well, there are a few other examples of a broader community-oriented uh, unionism uh, the tr the transit union has uh, made alliances with uh, tr transit rider organizations in a number of cities to try to defend bus and other routes that are being cut. Uh, I mean, lo locally, uh, the uh, AFSME, the public employee union, uh, allied with the mental health movement to try to stop uh, privatization of uh, uh, mental health clinics. Uh, so I think that uh, there is uh, some interest in that. Uh, we'll see, perhaps next week, the AFL-CIO has a uh, discussion blog going on that uh, in leading up to their convention at the beginning of September, and each week there's a different topic, and uh, they ask different people to 
pose these questions. So next week, in fact, I'm posing a question about what role unions ought to play in community mo solidarity movements. And I'll be curious to see what kind of re response I get from, from that. So there, there are examples of it, but it's one of the best examples of it is what the CTU has done. Time for a couple more questions. I've been favoring this side of the room, so I should, um, in the back there, Clarence. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm a first year in the college. This question is unfortunately also for Mr. Sharkey. Um, yeah, uh, I would be more than willing. Okay. Everyone's been to school, so it's easy to talk about schools. <laughs> um, with the last few actions, um, there has been a lot of talk um, from the CTU leadership um, about registering 250,000 voters, basically with the pretty much explicit uh, intent of taking on the mayor in the 2015 election. Um, my question is sort of, is that the fight that you guys want to take on, both in terms of, like, do you think, is that something that can be won? If, what would it mean not to win that for the future of the broader movement? Because, um, I mean, like, if the mayor is anything, he's very experienced at electoral politics. Um, just sort of, the question, I guess, is how does an electoral strategy relate to the broader uh, goals of the campaigns? And sort of like, even if you did take out the mayor, so to speak, how would that affect the campaign? Because these privatization, to do these privatization campaigns, are they unique to this mayor, or is there sort of a more entrenched, uh, you know, uh, drive towards privatization that would still be there even if uh, you know, an election was won? Um, that's a great question. Uh, those are all things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, what are you doing this summer? <laughs> <laughs> we, we're always, there's always organizing going on at the CTO. Um, uh, no, look at, um, I mean, you hit on some real things, which is there's some contradictions involved in electoral politics right now, which is that, you know, there really is a bipartisan consensus about what's going on in the education movement, in the educa you know, the, the quote unquote education reform movement. Um, you know, the race to the top was Obama's idea, although I, I think both Arne Duncan and Rahm Emanuel claim credit for it. Um, you, you know, um, it's really not so different from what Bush was pushing in Race to the Top in terms of the way that, that it closes schools and uses accountability and test scores and, and, and the rest of it. Um, so then the question then becomes, well, if it's bipartisan movement, what do you, you know, and, and there's consensus about it across the political spectrum, what, is, what are you going to get by pushing electoral strategy? And, and I'll, I'll say a couple things about it. Um, w one thing about it, frankly, is that it's a response to the frustration of a lot of our members, and don't forget we're a democratic organization, in which people said, how could we lose the school closing fight? How, how could they close 50 schools? The, you know, uh, you know, WB, the, the Sun Times, for God's sake, called for 21 schools to be spared. You know, the the 13 hearing officers broke ranks. The um, the BEZ and Catalyst and all the sort of like the, the the leading news organizations on this question were coming in and you know roundly criticizing. I mean, there, I don't think there was a serious commentator in Chicago to maybe the editorial pages of the Tribune, which which maybe isn't serious, um, who who, re, who really like thought this was a good idea, and yet they still went through with it. And the people therefore made the conclusion: well, of course they could go through with it because they control the government. You know, Rahm Emanuel appoints the school board, it's appointed board, and, and they were ideologically determined to do it. They pushed through. And so the response to that is change the government, you know, change who's in, in the government. So th th that's, a, that's a, a, a real sort of sentiment. And, uh, you know, it also reflects, honestly, a, a, a real shift in mood, especially among African Americans in the city of Chicago. Um, you know, who, you know, f the CTU is lucky enough to have as its most substantial base in, 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 in many important ways. And, you know, we're, we're talking about a, gr a group of folks that uh, elected a um, uh, Emmanuel, frankly, because he was Obama's chief of staff and people gave him benefit of a doubt. And there's been a change in that political sentiment. That is not true in the same way. You know, the, the, the guy's poll numbers are way down. The, the, there's a, a frustration among a whole layer of activists. I mean, among, among 
you know, African American teachers, which are way, you know, school privatization has meant CPS teaching force has gone from 42% black about 15 years ago to about 30% black now, and that's a pretty big, steep decline um, because the school closing typically speaking, target both the schools that are most heavily black and who have the most heavily black staffs. But, you know, but at any rate, that's, you know, so, so there's that shift. But also probably that, the, you know, the union um, thinks that it's not just a question of sort of tilting at the mayoral windmill. We actually are going to need to do some real work um, rebuilding a, uh, a base. You know, the union CTU 20 years ago um, when it was a... a, a a union that had just gotten off uh, nine strikes over a course of 20-some years, had in every ward and precinct and, 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 and legislative district a rank-and-file leader that was responsible for like building relationships with legislators, had a group of other teachers that lived there who, who, who were extremely effective political force. That needs to be rebuilt. So, th so that's one thing. We, we need to... Um, we need to do some work out in the neighborhoods among some political issues that are that maybe aren't sort of the, the sort of the big electoral picture. But we need to do some work about building, for example, for tax income and finance reform, or for some um, you know for some kind of progressive taxation in the state, or for a, an elected representative school board. So those are all things which we think are going to actually that, that we're going to move the work practically. Because you're right, if you look at Wisconsin, what happened there is that all the frustration and the anger about about Act Five and the, and the taking away of collective bargaining rights in Wisconsin got channeled into an electoral run at Scott Walker, the recall election, which ultimately reproduced the same result as the election that they had just run, you know, a year and a half earlier, and uh, was a huge waste of resources and whatnot, and, and we're determined to avoid that mistake. So one last question. Hi. My name is Michael, and I'm a third year in the college. And I basically wanted to ask that, so there, there definitely seems to be like hysteria just in the nation at large around schools and how they don't work and it's broken and all this kind of thing. But obviously, most of our schools are not, they're fine, right? Like Andover operates essentially like a liberal arts school or whatever, and nobody is worried that people there aren't getting um, in education, but then, in, but in these inner city schools, we have to cut art, we have to do all of this other stuff, um, and just bring it down to the bare bones. And basically, okay, I guess that my point is, yeah, I guess it's kind of long. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but so poverty really seems to be the biggest indicator, right? It doesn't have to do really with a lot of this other stuff. It's kind of fluff, char schools, etc. And my question is, can human rights, like we're here to talk about human rights and education, but can that, can that kind of framework address these kind of structural issues that really seem to be driving um, the, the differences and outcomes, which seems to be that there are poor students, um, their home lives, their neighborhoods, et cetera. Like, is, is the human rights framework enough to create this kind of overall social change that maybe we need to see? It's a good question. I don't think it's enough. I think it's one of the elements in what is a very you know, long-term political struggle. If we're talking about groups that want to try to reverse some of the um, inequalities that have been created in society when we go to a market system, I mean, how great has that worked for healthcare, for example, um, then we want to use an intellectual and political framework that talks about universal rights. In other words, that everyone, regardless of income, is entitled to certain, to make certain demands on the government. I mean, that's what it's about. It's a fundamental difference in the way you perceive the role of the state. And so human rights provides a framework that says that it's the obligation of states to provide the, ask what people need for a dignified life, including the right to a decent education that will enable you to make a living, the right to health, access to health care, et cetera. So they are ideas, but they're only going to make a difference insofar as people take them up and incorporate them into pragmatic political organizing. So I think human rights aren't enough, but human rights can be one of the lodestars that we use in order to try to 
either correct or undo some of the inequalities that have been imposed on access to things like a decent education by a system that is run increasingly uh, along market guidelines. So if you have it, you can get it, but if you don't, too bad. Any last comments? Well, please join me in thanking our three speakers.